All right, it's three o'clock. So we're gonna start with the Agri Tourism Association advances two century farms. So I am uh, Doug Joyer and the other century farm is Brad Grit, Grit Farms and he couldn't make it uh, today. They're getting ready for the fall season. So he submitted a video that we're gonna watch and then I'll talk about my farm after he's done. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Brad Grit of Grit's Farm and Buff located in Buffalo, West Virginia. Just a little about myself and our and our farm. Um, my family has been farming in West Virginia since 1927, and have done various things from from eggs to grain farming to tobacco, greenhouses, a lot of different things. But uh, we got into the agritourism world in the uh, unofficially 2006, 2007, and really officially in 2012. Um, from that, we, you know, saw saw some opportunities and uh, were introduced to the organization that this pre presentation today is largely going to be based upon um, NAFTMA, the North American Farm Direct Marketing Association. Uh, so I just want to, myself along with uh, Doug Joyer, we'd just like to tell you a little bit about how this organization has helped both of our farms um, advance and be able to grow and uh, what what being in an organization like this and an organization like this can can really do to help farms around the around the world to be successful in the agritourism world. A few of the things I'm going to cover today are best practices, marketing or promotional strategies and benchmarking. Um, from that, uh, the first one being being marketing, organizations like this really help you to to see what what else is out there and and talk to folks in in your industry and and learn directly from them of how these how these things how these marketing tools and applications are you know benefiting their their businesses. In addition, NAFTMA facilitates a lot of this through whether it's webinars, uh, roundtable discussions, whether in person or online and, um, and virtual virtual workshops, plus plus things like farm tours where you can actually see these these marketing applications, you know, firsthand live in in practice. Um, and in addition to that, being at events like the conference or farm tours or the ALR, all the different events that NAFMA host gives you opportunities to, to sit down and discuss with your, you know, your colleagues of what was really going well for you and what's what's not and maybe where you where you need some help and uh, they'll provide you with with some of that information. Additionally, just the culture of an organization like this, and I think a culture of of farmers in general is is sharing so anytime. You meet somebody in in farming or agriculture. Um, doesn't matter who they are. If you've ever met them before, if you know you you ask them a question, they're they're always going to look for a way to help you. So, I think that culture that we as all you know in the agritourism world have is and that farmer culture of of sharing is is very is very well important and um, is a great benefit that we have that I that I don't know that other industries are able to to have that have that benefit. Um, the second thing is um, is benchmarking. So uh, NAFTMA is, has, has a partnership um, that <clears throat> with Agritourism Life that's allowing uh, benchmarking to go on in, in our industry. And where, where this comes in in great benefit is you you may go visit a farm that's 10 times the size of yours and you think, wow, like it's a beautiful place, but I'll never be there. And with with something like benchmarking, you can you can really see, OK, well, like, actually, I'm doing I'm doing pretty good or I need to improve in this area based upon your comparison to a, a like size farm or maybe a farm that's in an, a regional area closer to yours. And you can you can learn from that of like, OK, like this is what this is where they're kind of falling on the on the radar. So so we're actually doing pretty good or maybe we need to adjust pricing or adjust um, our our cost structure based upon that. So so that benchmarking 
piece that, that we have available to us now is, is a really great, great addition. The last thing is um, with them is marketing and promotional strategies is again, you know, it kind of ties into best practices that uh, these, these best practices are, are something you see a lot, but marketing and promotion is definitely, definitely ties into that. But having an organization like this to really show you firsthand how you can benefit and where you can use better marketing and promotional strategies is, you know, really a benefit to, to your farm, um, what locally and, and just gives you, gives you a lot of ideas and, um, and just like every time, just like a lot of us here today, we'll, we'll meet some people at this, this conference and the next, the, the next thing we're going to do is jump on Facebook and, um, and follow those farms or follow those organizations. So by doing that, um, being in a, being in an organization really gives you that opportunity to, to meet, meet other people and, and see what they're doing, but also continue to follow along with, with their social medias and websites and see, see this, the tactics they're using and, you know, maybe implement those in, in your area as well. Uh, I appreciate all of your time today and um, look forward to throughout this conference. Um, I'm <clears throat> virtual, but I'm going to, you know, definitely be, be present on the, on the virtual side of things. So I would love to meet up with, with a lot of you uh, through that and, and make some connections and uh, be able to, whenever I always like to go on trips. So whenever I do, I'd love to visit some of your farms. Uh, thank you for your time and um, look forward to meeting and connecting with all of you in the future. Awesome. So that was Brad Grit. We got some people standing in the back. There's room in the front. Why don't we take this time to come get comfortable? Excited to see so many people here. Sure. Yeah. So uh, we're talking about how NAFMA has affected our farms. So NAF, NAFMA is, um, they got rid of the acronym like FFA did, Futures Farmers of America. So it's NAFMA, but what it used to stand for was North, Amer or North America Direct or Farm Direct Marketing Association. So it's now um, tagline is like International Agritourism or Organization or Association. Um, so we're talking about how that farm, that organization has helped our century farms grow. Great question. And probably something I should cover before I start my talk. Um, you guys wanna come forward? There's a couple more seats. All right, so I'd like to thank Brad for uh, starting us off. I am Doug Joyer um, with Waldock Farm. I farm in Lionel Lakes, Minnesota. Um, my family farm started in 1916. Um, I'm the fourth generation farmer. I farm with my brothers and my mother, Mary, is the owner. She's the boss, the buck stops there. Um, her maiden name is Waldock. So that's where we get our farm name. Um, over the years, we've grown many different crops. Um, starting over a hundred years ago with hay and chickens, my great grandpa would take uh, his uh, buggy into town on Monday, work as a typesetter for the press, for the newspapers, and sell his product to his neighbors that he used to live next to in St. Paul, come back on the weekend and help farm on the weekend. So my grandma, my great grandma Ann and the kids ran the farm in those early days while he was a typesetter. Um, and then uh, uh, as the kids grew up, they got into dairy farming on the farm. Well, lot, with a lot of dairy farms in the 60s, we went, got out of dairy farming. Um, they're just, uh, the, the small dairies went, you know, we're kind of going through that phase again with the cycles where in the 60s in Minnesota, we lost a lot of dairy farms. Um, the small family dairy farms, but throughout the whole time we grew vegetables. We still sell vegetables out of our roadside stand that my grand, my great grandfather built in 1940 or in the 40s. So we ha have a very busy street that we live on. So we were able to sell vegetables there. My grandfather and his wife put up our first greenhouse in like the 70s, 80s. And uh, there was a little bit room left 
and my grandma Lucille said, I want to plant some flowers in that corner. Well, the next year they had to build a second greenhouse just for her flowers. Um, so, so today I would describe the farm as a grower retail garden center. So we grow 90% of the product that we sell. We farm 30 or 45 acres of, of fresh vegetables. Um, and just last year, we rebranded our agri tourism side of the business as Joyer Adventure Farm, where we have an educational barnyard, pick your own produce, sunflowers you walk through, and a pumpkin patch and corn maze with a bunch of activities that go with that as well. And that's an admission-based part of the farm. So to help describe the farm better, we have Wallock Farm, which is uh, the garden center and fresh produce, and Joyer Adventure Farm, which is really the agri tourism part of the business. And it was it it amazed me to meet a farm with as much diverse crops as we had when I met Brad five or six years ago at a NAFMA conference, um, and that brought us together. Um, it, there is there is a, a handful of a few other farms really in in a, in the North America that that have the description that we have as a business. Um, in the organization, there are some more that have few facets, but the fact that we go garden center all the way to corn maze is, uh, is, is pretty unique. Um, so I was, uh, let's just find my place. So it is hard to find someone with a similar passion and business experience. Um, so I feel very blessed that I found a, an organization with like-minded people. I like how I try to describe it to friends is like, if you take in uh, the, the United States, 2% of us are farmers, right? That's, that's a stat that's pretty well known amongst farmers. But if you, how many of them actually want people on their farm? I think it's like another 2%. <laughs> so like the, the uniqueness of us being farmers and then the outgoingness of us as farmers to welcome people home, it's a pretty, it makes us pretty unique and it's hard to find like-minded people. So it's awesome to be amongst you here. So I went from farming 35 acres of fresh vegetables um, to needing to know how to host a thousand people a few weekends in October. Um, so having the connection to our annual conference, um, with the annual conference, we have farm tours. So I was able to go on farm tours and see how other farms are doing it. Um, and the, the, the Facebook page where we communicate, I was able to gear up for the fall for the last 10 years and, and go through it with the confidence that I could handle it. Like, so how do you gear up for um, some of the challenges of having a thousand people? You know, um, in America, we all drive everywhere. So you gotta be able to host them in the parking lot. How do you set up a parking lot? Um, well, by being in an organization like NAFMA, I can learn from other people's um, knowledge. And I, I heard or found out that you have a well-lined parking lot and attendants that are parking people, you can fit about 120 cars per acre. Well, I didn't have to go out there and count my parking lot. I just learned that from that. But if you don't have it well planned out, you get about a hundred cars per acre. They park farther apart. So you'd need more parking if you aren't gonna be, have any attendants out there working it. And then like, what's the flow of your farm? How are people gonna get through your farm? So one of the best advice that I got um, from a fellow farmer was to pay attention to the airport because the airport is probably the best place to learn about signage. Like, do you have to ask anyone where you have to go once you know your gate number? You don't even have to ask the gate number. They have a screen that tells you your gate. And then when you're walking down the aisles and you know, once you can't see one that's telling you where the gates are, you can already see the next one. So if you really have one, that's the standard for excellent signage. And then if you get to the point where you have so many people on your farm and all your signage is at eye level, well, really you only have signage for the first person in line. You got to move that up to be above the crowd's head. So as you geared up for more people, you got to pay attention to where your signage is. And then even if you have that many people, depending on your parking lot size, like what's your goal? Like if you have a limited parking lot size, maybe you don't want people to stay all day. So you get rid of the benches so they're not comfortable. So they have to walk the whole time, <laughs> right? <laughs> so there's different ways we can set up our farms that either welcome people to stay all day and get more benches and the benefit to having them stay all day is maybe they'll eat another meal out of the food truck or eat another bag of kettle corn 
Um, but if you don't have the parking space to handle that, then you almost have to work on getting throughput and how fast can people get through your farm so they can leave and another person can take that parking spot. So Brad talked about best practices and I'd like to hit on that a little bit as well. Sometimes you don't even know what you don't know, right? So by going amongst a lot of people, you can learn that you need an emergency plan. Um, you know, what you do in certain scenarios as soon as you invite public on your farm. And I think they have some sessions at the conference about that. And they also had some about zoning and ordinances. All those things come to the forefront. And then also barnyard, if you're gonna have animals on display, what's the best practice for that? Um, and food safety, how close should your food be to your barnyard? Um, and then hayride safety, how are you transporting people around your farm safely? Um, and even with still everything that I've gotten from NAFMA, there's still more I wanna learn. The, my next thing that I wanna reach out and learn about is how to develop a, a, a good um, worker team, like the, almost the middle management of the farm. How can I, I've got a lot of family that, that I, works on the farm, but how do we get another layer of uh, people who buy in so we all don't have to work Labor Day weekend or all that stuff. So I'm, I'm gonna be looking for a guidance from my peers on, on uh, how to grow and manage and develop a good farm staff on the farm. So, and then when at a conference like this one, you really only get out what you put in. So um, the more you share, the more people share with you. Um, at the openness culture that Brad talked about at NAFMA was really set, I feel like, from the farmers before us who shared so much with us. And then it's our responsibility to, to share and keep that openness going. Because there's other trade organizations out there that don't have open sharing and uh, you know, like they have their trade secrets kind of nice with it being a, a, such a big orga organization. There's not very members in Minnesota. Well, there is one 15 minutes away from my farm. So there's some, so, but it, it's got an openness culture that's good. Um, so from all the things that we talked about, like benchmarking, um, learning best practices from farm tours, educational sessions, marketing and promotional material. And what I've talked about, about how to host a thousand people um, and what, and what I need to continue to grow and learn about. Um, our two farms have been able to uh, capitalize on the agritourism growth that we've had in our community. So uh, NAFMA um, has this organization in North America helped us to do that and grow. Um, you get out of the, the, the connections, um, what you put into them. Brad and I have gotten so much out of the organization that we are, um, that we are actually board members on the volunteer uh, on a voluntary basis of the organization. Um, with the experiences that I've gained from NAFMA and other continuing education programs, the fourth generation uh, is able to be the first generation at Waldock Farm to be to make its sole income from the farm. All other generations had 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 other sources of income. Thank you for listening, and I encourage you to start, find a local organization to help you grow in your community. Thanks. Thank you, Doug. Any, no, it's, wow, that was right on time. Nice. Good job. So we have another speaker now, unfortunately. Yeah. So if you have questions, you could put them on Whova, and he'll be able to see what the questions are. Yep, or meet me afterwards. I'm, I'm here today. The next speaker is a virtual video.
Hello, my name is Nicole Bourgeois, and I'm joining you from lovely British Columbia, Canada, and I welcome you to this presentation where I'm going to talk a little bit about regenerative tourism opportunities for agriculture, agritourism operators. While sustainable tourism practices have been numerous and impactful, there are now active calls to action to go further by incorporating principles of the regenerative design of tourism. Regenerative efforts are intended to restore things to a much better, higher, or more worthy state and to radically change practices for the better. Regenerative tourism will require a deepened commitment by tourism operations to restore and ultimately regenerate the living systems that support tourism activity. This movement is being led by regenerative agriculture, which has taken a more holistic approach than conventional agriculture, and it's aimed at increasing biodiversity, enriching soils, and improving watersheds that lead to better health and vitality for farming communities. Agritourism operations are in a unique and potentially impactful position to incorporate concepts of regenerative agriculture and tourism into their operations. In this session, I will describe concepts of regenerative agriculture and tourism, and I'll contrast them to conventional and sustainable approaches. I'll provide a couple of different examples of uh, an operator and an initiative to profile some of what they're doing to educate society. And at the end, I'll close with a definition of regenerative agritourism and hopefully pose a couple of questions for further um, investigation. I hope that some of my musings spark curiosity amongst those in the room, Zoom room, to uh, question more closely about how we can sort of move forward on these concepts, resulting in a more regenerative phenomenon for the planet. I'm going to attempt to embed a metaphor as a preface to my talk, as I was inspired by the need to use systems thinking and biomimicry to suggest parallels for regenerative tourism. Seeds are a useful metaphor for regeneration, as they're the vessel by which a plant regenerates itself. When we plant seeds or ideas and they germinate, take root, and receive resources necessary for their survival, they flourish. In order for them to create new seeds, which come from flowers, pollination needs to occur. This process of regeneration relies on healthy environments with supportive local growing conditions and an ever evolving regenerative system that mobilizes knowledge between different actors. In this way, learning is perhaps like the pollination process, whereby worker bees like this one move within the system from plant to plant gathering knowledge along the way, sharing and communicating with one another, and ensuring that flowers uh, produce new seeds. To regenerate means that something is restored to a better, higher, or more, more worthy state, and that it's radically altered for the better. So in order to achieve regenerative tourism, we need to be able to regenerate our system. Education is a vital part of this. And as such, I think we need to focus on learning and knowledge as key processes in our attempts to get a regenerative tourism system. This is a quote from Ann Pollock, who many of you probably know, who's been writing about regenerative tourism over the past few years. This quote helps us differentiate and yet see the links between conventional tourism, sustainable tourism, and regenerative tourism. It's a tall order and it immediately results in the question, how do we do this? But we're not alone in the quest for an answer to this question. She posits that the way that we've designed our tourism business model is really based on our known business as usual model. Sustainable tourism went a little bit further and it was about doing tourism better, but with less impact. It was still using the same business model. I was trying to achieve a greener, cleaner, and less harmful version of business as usual. Regenerative tourism is bolder, more inspiring, and aims not to just do less harm, but to go on and restore the harm that our system has already done to the natural world and create conditions of life to flourish. As I said, we're not alone in this. 
it's important to note that the concept, principles, and practices of regeneration are not the sole preoccupation of those in tourism. Many other sectors are well ahead of tourism in applying these concepts to redesign systems in agriculture, planning, urban design, economic development, and the circular economy, to name a few. If we apply this shift, a shifting paradigm to tourism, it creates an opportunity to reflect on where we've come from and what knowledge we've gained along the way and what our desired future looks like. In this journey, we'll identify numerous gaps to our existing knowledge that will need to be filled to create learning opportunities for us all. On the slide, you can see some of the paradigm shifts taking place in regenerative agriculture, where farms are looking at um, formerly in conventional agriculture, competing with nature to those sorts of practices that are more in partnership with nature, some that perhaps disturbed soil in ways that it couldn't respond to initiatives to protect the soil. Moving from monoculture to diversity and removing moving from a reductionist sort of view of our farm to a more holistic understanding of our farm within the broader ecosystem. Others that are involved in regenerative work are using the concepts, principles and practices of regenerative design. If we were to position the concept of regenerative uh, design in context, we can see that it requires us to rethink our conventional approaches represented on the left and evolve from the lessons learned in green design and sustainable design to create living systems that are capable of regenerating themselves, more represented on the right. This shift identifies a number of priorities for agritourism opportunities to ensure they have the knowledge they need to be successful in this transition. So in summary, to achieve that regenerative design, we need to be thinking systems thinking, interdisciplinary collaboration, so working with others perhaps outside of our sector, and recognizing our dependence, uh, all of our dependence on natural capital. So where are we at in this change? Um, if we think about, um, if we use a change management process, I'd say um, what we're trying to uh, identify is, uh, you know, are we still at awareness stage? Are we fully in desire? Are we knowledgeable? Do we have the ability? And, and how do we maybe reinforce this so that it, we don't go back to business as usual? So I've applied the ADCAR uh, model for change management here. Um, so I'd ask us all, and I, I you know, my, my idea is that we're probably somewhere between the aware, awareness and desire, and hopefully conversations like this move us further along. But ask ourselves, you know, are, are we aware enough about regenerative agritourism? Is there a collective will and desire to move in this direction? If so, does everyone have the knowledge that we need to be successful? Does everyone have the ability or skills that they need to support this desired change? And what reinforcements need to be put in place that we don't revert back? Regenerative tourism will require us to redesign the aims and intended outcomes of our efforts. Are we trying to sustain tourism as an industry? Or are we trying to sustain and enhance the regenerative capacity of our ecological, environmental, and social systems? Tourism often refers to itself as an industry, opposed to recognizing its, uh, its role in broader um, societal uh, issues. This serves to limit our potential contributions to broader societal issues and, and that the industry is not paying attention to, aware of, or even present uh, to help support. Uh, for example, the goal of regenerative agritourism would not be solely about farm income, but about a much larger set of collective aims such as land stewardship, support for food systems, connection to nature, traditional knowledge, and other such priorities. This is an important quote from Henry Williamson. Regeneration can only come through the change of heart in the individual. This can often happen via exposure to places where people have the chance for multi-sensory experiences. Regenerative agritourism could or should prioritize place as unique in our learning system. In fact, it's those life-changing experiences with multi-sensory uh, impacts at a farm uh, or with a you know learning about farms um, that has the potential to carry knowledge to new generations. Agritourism operations are in a unique and potentially impactful position to support this because of this unique um, this vantage point. 
their position at the nexus of two sectors, agriculture and tourism, and the embeddedness of consumer interaction in place, positions operators to be powerful leaders in this space. Their visitors will also emerge as pollinators of the knowledge gained to spread important messages about regenerative agriculture throughout larger society. I'm going to just close with two case studies. The first case study is of Yonder. This is a story of Tim and Sarah Southwell, who own and operate ABC Acres in Montana, which is a beef, pork, and poultry operation. It also raises seasonal fruits and vegetables. In 2016, after their foray into agritourism via rental to visitors, they found that agritourism resulted in an increased product, uh, in increased product sales, but that revenue from agritourism surpassed revenue from meat and produce sales. Motivated by the need to address nature deficit disorder, Tim saw that farmers and ranchers, uh, the land stewards in the area, had a key, key play to role in satisfying consumer demand for nature experiences while providing a podium for regenerative producers to share their goods, experiences, and messages while bolstering their income. In his market research, looking for others that were doing this, Tim found that existing booking platforms were not telling the stories of farms. So he decided to start a new booking platform, Yonder, with colleague Bill Lee. Their vision is to let Yonder be the conduit for telling the story of the farm while helping people become champions of nature and assisting land stewards with their businesses. This case highlights an individual operator who connected the dots and linked his regenerative agricultural practices to visitors on his farm. His actions also identified a systemic shortfall in the marketing system to highlight and elevate consu consumers to other agritourism experiences where they could learn about land stewardship. The next case study is about is from the island country of Banat, Vanuatu and profiles their successful food tourism and agritourism initiative. This initiative was piloted in 2021 in all six provinces of Vanuatu and aligned with their sustainable tourism strategy. The initiative focused on three activities, including fieldwork, training and awareness on food tourism, and the creation of agritourism experiences and cooking demonstrations to encourage eating local nutrient dense foods and preserving traditional knowledge. Since it was launched, this initiative, this initiative has 27 food tourism and agritourism operators registered. All of these obtained grants of $10,000 to purchase equipment to support their adaptation, including things like solar systems, water tanks, farming equipment, and intensive training uh, participants has resulted in a culture shift to support local industries and local procurement. The Department of Education has committed to sending school groups to an experience to experience agritourism opportunities with the aim of restoring pride in the food and farming heritage of the young indigenous Mi Vanuatu. They also established an agritourism association with representation from six provinces who have endorsed their constitution. They've been secured ongoing financial contributions from the EU Development Fund in New Zealand for the next three years to take on an additional 30 Indigenous Nii Vanuatu entrepreneurs. It will be, uh, as it moves forward, uh, the intent is to change the perception of tourists to expect and seek out Vanuatu's traditional local cuisine and venture out into rural agricultural communities, thereby enhancing their livelihoods of those communities. This case study highlights the potential and impact of regenerative tourism at a cultural level to contribute to reparations that preserve traditional knowledge, protect sustainable practices, and create pride in new generations. I hope my presentation has allowed you to reflect on where agritourism has opportunity to contribute to regeneration. This is a former definition that I used to share around sustainable tourism. Regeneration or regenerative tourism has the potential to build on our past knowledge and design a learning system that allows us um, to move forward. So I compare this slide with my newfound knowledge. Uh, and I'll leave you with this uh, idea that regenerative tourism is tourism that enables residents or if talking about agritourism farms, uh, to thrive in place by showcasing and showcasing their amenities with outsiders in a way that infuses valued capital into the system. 
this capital is reinvested back into the system um, to ensure that core natural and cultural amenities flourish over time. And in closing, I would leave you to say embedding feedback loops for system change is important. So what learning can agritourism operators or initiatives share about their experiences in regenerative agritourism? Where are they having an impact? Where do they concentrate on system change to be more regenerative? And if learning is indeed the key pollinator for regeneration to occur, how can we ensure that learning, in, learning opportunities are impactful for, for visitors? Thank you for attending the presentation. I hope I provided some food for thought. I'll close here. So we have one more presenter, just waiting for our presenter. Here he comes. In person. <clears throat> what a crowd. Wow. Are you putting up my PowerPoint? Yeah. Oh, partnering with, there it is, perfect. Can you, um, excuse me, when I say next slide, can you do that for me, please? Yeah, but I don't know how to use it. Thank you. <laughs> I'm of that generation. Anyway, um, partnering with, thanks for all, all of you for coming. Um, uh, this is the title, my name is Danny Baker, and next slide. We have an organic farm uh, on Wellesley Island, which is an, a nine mile long island in the middle of the St. Lawrence River. It's an American island and it's accessed by Interstate I-81, which goes on from there into Canada. So we don't need a boat to get to our farm. Um, next slide. So we're highly diversified. We're small, we have 102 acres. We have a, a herd of meat cows, uh, beef cows. We have meat goats, we have some pigs. We have annual vegetables and next slide. <clears throat> and we um, have a few rustic campsites on our farm. We host volunteers year round. Um, we give tours and that's a shot of me giving a tour in the enchanted edible forest. Speaking of regenerative, that's probably the most regenerative kind of planting you can do, model after a forest edge. And down here on the right is an event that we, we hold events in the edible forest also. Next slide. And the Enchanted Edible Forest. So we started the farm 17 years ago. And on the seventh year, I got inspired by a, a two hour class on permaculture to, um, to plant uh, an edible forest. And uh, I did. And so that's 10 years ago. Next slide. And here's a shot of a, an event, a party in, in the, uh, it's an acre now in the acre land of landscape food plants. Next. And there's my cherry trees in bloom. Next. And there's the trellis, which now has grapes hanging inside of it. I'm so excited. Next. Okay, so partnering with not-for-profits. So the first step is, of course, planning. I'm gonna, I'm having trouble seeing this. Let's see, I can do it. Can I turn this around? Yeah, good, okay. <clears throat> so um, I've, I've, I've um, partnered with a number of not-for-profits uh, in my community. So first thing is to contact the not-for-profit and figure out what kind of event they wanna do, or sometimes they call me. Um, and then we like to promote the other local farms. So I have friends who have wineries. I have a, a couple of friends who have a, a creameries. They make cheese from their dairy cattle. Um, I know a local flower grower, grower who does beautiful bouquets. And um, usually the bands will do it for free. So um, we get these people together so they can promote their own farms, their own products. Um, the, band, the bands that I've in, invited have actually gotten other gigs because they've performed um, at, in my venue. And then we develop a poster. Um, we write press releases, solicit media sponsors, 
um, schedule appearances on local TV and radio shows, and place signage on the road pointing to the farm. So I'm going to go over some of these things. Next slide, please. Okay, so these are some of the examples of not-for-profits and the event theme. So we have a local community foundation, and at this stage in their development, they were not very well known in the community. So the purpose of um, having an event with them in my venue was to increase community awareness of who they were and what they did. Um, local organic, the local New York State, um, NOFA, did a, a field day in my farm, and that was really for farmer education. So that was the purpose. Um, a local homesteader organization also uh, partnered with me, and it was more for ecology-friendly ecology gardening. Um, the, no, no, the local nature center, which actually is right down the road in the state park, um, we did a couple of fundraisers. We called it Art for Nature. And we had plein air painters painting in my farm and in the nature center all day. And then we had a reception um, in the evening with their paintings hanging up for sale and a band and you know cheese and, and wine. Um, and then a, we partnered with the local hospital um, for a capital campaign. And uh, the uh, development person I worked with there told me that it was the first time that she got a bunch of people in the same room that she could approach to uh, support her capital campaign. And she, she said she probably got around $30,000 ultimately from that group because we had them all together um, on my farm. Next. Okay, so these are just a couple of samples of posters that we put together um, to hang up around town and uh, promote. So, oh, I actually did a permaculture workshop too. I think that was, um, who was that with? Oh, I think that was the one with the, um, the homesteader not-for-profit. And then of course with Nofa New York. I'll let you read those for a second just to see what we included. Okay, next slide. Okay, and these were a little more sophisticated. Um, <laughs> so the wine and cheese tasting with, for the Northern New York Community Foundation. Um, and also the art for nature. That was, I think, before COVID, that was my last one. And then of course COVID happened. But I want you to look at the bottom. So we wanted to be sure to include the logos of all the participating farms um, and businesses. I think there's uh, also a, a well, on the right one, there's a framing business, also the focal point. They do framing for photos, for pictures rather. And then all the media sponsors. So I would just go around, you know, I, I, I'm not shy. I just would go around to all the local television and uh, radio shows and ask them if they'd be willing to sponsor us, like give us a little airplay in exchange for their logos on our, our flyer. And most of them are willing to do it. So we had we got North, North Country Public Radio and the public TV station and a bunch of, of private um, radio stations and TV stations. Um, so that's that's it. Next. Okay, here's an example of a press release. <clears throat> Just in those days, we actually sent paper ones. Well, not, I mean, in whatever. It's different now because, you know, you with emails, you just put it all on one and they, they don't need it as an attachment. You can just put it, but anyway. So just, you know, what, where, when, why, and how. Very simple. Um, all proceeds will go to the Northern New York Community Foundation. And listing the names of the businesses. Again, PR for them. Next slide. So just here's an example of a crowd on my big patio in the edible forest at the uh, one of the art for nature events. Next, very relaxing, casual. Um, and at the event, at some events, I've actually given garden tours. So I don't have um, a poster about this, but I did. I did a, an event with the local art museum, the Remington Museum in Ogdensburg, and it was a high tea and tour. So about 20 ladies came and it was a fundraiser for the art museum. About 20 ladies came, we had, it was catered. We had some tea and crumpets. And then I, I took them around, they were all mostly, they were all gardeners. And I took them around for a tour of, of the, uh, the garden. And actually I have one coming up in, with the local uh, public, uh, public television station. We're gonna do something similar um, in October, early October, next. Of course, live music, 
Next. And I mentioned the plain air one. So here's a, a couple of artists actually painting right in my garden. Next. Okay, so the benefits. First of all, it's free publicity for the farm because all of those media are publicizing the farm as well as the event and free publicity for the not-for-profits. Um, I'm also promoting other agritourism venues besides my own, promote local artists and musicians, help not-for-profits advance their missions, goodwill for the farm and everyone actually, and a good time had by all. It's like win, 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 win. <laughs> Next. And thank you. All right, I, 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 we can, um, I'm happy. To, I, this is the last presentation of the hour. So I'm happy to answer questions um, if you have any or tell you more about the garden or whatever you wanna know. If anybody has questions, I have a microphone, I can come around. I'd love to hear more about the edible forest. Edible forest, okay. Uh, well, um, I'm gonna get here. So I was inspired to plant it by a two hour course on permaculture. I'd never heard the word before the concept, but the ideas made so much sense to me. It was like a revelation. Before the two hours were over, I decided I wanted to plant an edible forest. Realized it was the seventh year of doing annual vegetables. And I think I had the seven year itch. I was ready to do something different. And the promise of having my labor reduced going forward was very intriguing. Because if you, if you guys are any of you who are gardeners or farmers, you know with annual vegetables, your labor does not change from year to year. With a perennial planting, you plant it once and it grows bigger and produces more every year. You still have to manage it and maintain it. But the amount of labor per square foot is like, incredibly less once it's established. So basically it's modeled after a forest edge where um, you have all of the, the vertical layers from tall trees to, to medium-sized trees, to shrubs, to herbaceous plants, to ground cover roots and vines. And it's modeled, not only does it emulate the edge of a forest from that standpoint, but in nature, no one cultivates, no one weeds, no one, sprays for pests, no one applies fertilizer. What, what you do when you plant a garden like this is you, you um, install plants and that provide all these functions as well as you invite natural creatures in to serve you, to, to do your pest management and to fertilize for you. So um, it's, a, it's a little challenging to plant it and I actually enjoyed that process. It was very intellectually stimulating. But once, um, once you put it all together, it kind of after around three or five years, it kind of assumes a life of its own. And then you just get to observe how things evolve and you can tweak it here and there, you know, but um, it's, it's really, it's a marvelous, joyful uh, undertaking. Yes. Okay, well, I partner with a lot of land trusts in the area. And, you know, their mission and my mission are very similar. And um, we've been really, wow. So this one land trust, um, they, um, they sponsored a tour of my garden. And I, I, by the way, I didn't mention it here, but I wrote a book about my, not about my garden, but to help anyone plant a similar planting for any size plot. And it's out there, I'll sell it to you if you want after. But meanwhile, so they came, like 25 people from the land trust came for the tour and a lot of them bought my book. And then, um, so I pitched a television show to my local TV station about the garden. They're very interested, so we have to raise a lot of money. So I approached the, uh, I was at an event, like their annual dinner, I approached the treasurer and I said, you know, we're, um, you know, I pitched this TV show, we're gonna have to raise money. Oh, we'd really love to support that. So they're talking about, you know, giving us money or giving the station money to fund the production and in exchange, they'll get publicity on the public station. Is that a good answer for you? Okay. <laughs> Other questions? Yes. Is it, oh, hi, sorry. When you're partnering with them, yep. are you gaining revenue no. as well as goodwill? Just it's no. just like marketing no for yourself. Just goodwill, marketing, 
Goodwill, you know, no, no revenue, but, but often there's ancillary business that comes because of the exposure. And the Goodwill, you know, you can't, it's priceless, right? Yes. Back there, no? Yes. It's all free. It's all free. So it's donated to you. Yeah, they will they'll give the like the wineries will will give tastings. And then if someone wants a glass, they will pay the winery for the glass of wine. Okay. Yeah. Right. So there's no out of pocket cost. No, you, not just, really. Not for these whatsoever. No. The space. Yep. So how are you allowed or are you allowed to have um, wineries come in if they serve their alcohol? No. They have the license. So you don't have to have any kind nope. of a liquor nope. license? Nope. Nope. I mean, I do have insurance that covers events there, like if somebody falls in the pond, I suppose. I mean, you know, actually, I think I have to get, a, I'm trying to think, it's been a couple of years because of COVID, um, but I always tell my insurer that I'm having this event and I think, yeah, whatever. But it's not expensive for me to cover. The winery is the one that's covering the liquor issue. Hey, just a couple of questions. Um, what was your initial investment for the food forest itself? And um, does your other farm business um, cover sort of your operating? Like, how does this play into your overall budget? Well, we don't really run our farm like you should run a business. Um, <laughs> Um, this edible, I don't even want to answer your question because um, it's a lot of money. No, I have all, I had a lot of machine work, all that stonework. I mean, the, the infrastructure, you know, I wanted to make it a venue where we could have events. Now, when you make a capital investment, it may not get returns in the next two or three years, but ultimately you hope it will. I, I hope. So anyway, I could rent this for weddings. I could rent it out for events, um, you know, for other kinds of events. Um, I do you pick in it, so I get some income from that. Um, but um, I, I plan actually to make it a not-for-profit eventually, um, as an educational venue, and you know, and get some some donation funding, and also the proceeds, the um, the um, revenue from the book I wrote is going to subsidize it as well. And then you pick tours, we charge for tours, you know, all of that would be income um, for the not for profit and that way it can carry on after I'm gone. So, so you just sort of asked what I was going to I'm over here. So you just sort of answered about that you have you pick because you're not aiming at 100% productive capacity. This is mostly a backdrop that sometimes you might sell some fruit out of or some yeah. product out of, but mostly it's. Well, you know, actually I'm selling more and more every year. So um, like a restaurant on the island, a seasonal restaurant approached me, he wanted herbs. So every week I deliver herbs and edible flowers to him. And that's all coming out of the garden. Um, I also, when, when I don't have you pickers to pick, by the way, you pick is a much more lucrative way to harvest than you harvesting. So I, you know, I'm doing one on this a little later today on the UPIC, but I mean, I charge people $5 to come in and $5 a pint, mix or match. If I pick, it takes me hours. You know, I mean, I charge, well, depending on what the fruit is, but I charge $5 for half a pint when I sell my berries, but still the amount of labor I have to put in to pick them, it's much more cost effective for me to have somebody else come and pick. But if I don't have somebody to come pick, like raspberries, they have to be picked every day, I pick them. I freeze them and then I, or I sell them fresh during the summer when I have lots of uh, farm, farm stand people. And then like my crop that's coming on now, if it's into September, I'll be picking it freezing and then I might jam. And the jam sell very well at my farm stand. So there's multiple revenue streams that are kind of coming out of this. Um, and so it's both, it's not, you know, it isn't like a big field full of strawberries where you have you know, either you harvest and you're selling wholesale or you have you pickers come in mobs. It's, it's for the experience when I have you pickers come, they might pick one or two pints, you know. All right, I hope I answered the question. We have a few online questions. Yes. Okay, 
So um, Wendy's question was, do zoning restrictions dictate the number or nature of your events? Well, I believe in apologizing rather than, rather than asking permission. Ignorance is bliss. Um, I, you know, we're, we're on a very rural road. What, I'm sorry. All right, I'll tell you a story. So to, to have another re revenue stream on my farm and because my builder, because it was on my builders who did the infrastructure for my garden, it, it was on his bucket list. We're just about finished building a tree house. And this is, this is like an Airbnb tree house. I mean, when I asked my builder how it compares to the ones on that TV show, Master Tree, he said equal or better. So this is, a, there's great potential for this. But when I called the zoning guy, and told him I was gonna build a tree house. He, I said, what paper do I have to file? What do I have to pay? He goes, well, is it on the ground? I said, no, it's up in a tree. He goes, well, then there's nothing you have to file. Now, I think, I think that's gonna change now when they discover what I've got. But um, that's so, you know, it's a very rural area, very little problem with that. And we're, and in terms of a crowd or anything, we're on a very rural road. Um, you know, it's, it, we have a hundred one, we, we have 1500 feet frontage on one side and 2000 on the other. So, you know, we're not really, and our neighbors are friendly. So, you know, it's not really, it hasn't been an issue. Other question. Oh, that was, was that an online question? Do you have others? Says, um, wondering what, type of nonprofits are attracted specifically to farm venues? I think anyone. I mean, we've had an art museum, the, the uh, Northern New York Community Foundation. Um, we've had, uh, you know, land trusts. We've had um, the Nature Center. Um, what else? The, the WPB, the, the uh, TV station is going to be there next month um, or two months. I, I don't really think it matters. You know, if they're interested, we'll do it. <laughs> Yes. Anything else? Any other questions? What's your max size of event? Numbers of people? I think we could. I, I had a wedding planner come and take a look at it. And she said, well, under the tent, we could sit 80 for a wedding. And in the entire garden, and this is just the first half acre, because after three years, I expanded to another, you know, don't ask. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, about 200 you know, because they could stand on the grass and see and because there's a little hillside. It's, you know, um, yeah, we could accommodate quite a few people. I haven't rented it out yet, though, because first I had to improve a piece of infrastructure. I have a deep end of a pond and the railing was not high enough. So I needed to build it up just so, you know, somebody drunk doesn't fall over. But um, honestly, I don't want to manage it. I had some rental properties when I was younger and I don't enjoy managing so I would need to hire someone if and when I'm ready to do that, you know, for a percentage of the profit or something, yeah. Yes. Why don't you go to the farm? That's a good question. Um, I actually, when I design, we do have golf carts, electric golf carts where we can drive someone around if, they, if they're not able to emulate. And when I, designed the edible forest, I was thinking about that. And I actually had a, a disability specialist um, from the local organization come and look it over and tell me, you know, if it was appropriately, you know, how to make it accessible. And actually I had a swale, which is an indentation, you know, to capture water. And when he got to the swale, he said, Danny, a wheelchair would tip over here. So I filled it in. You know, it was just for show and tell anyway. I didn't need the swale to do water, but anyway, I filled it in. So now it's level. So you can you could definitely run um, an electric wheelchair around there, or I could drive somebody around in a golf cart, which I've done before. And I built nice wide paths. So, uh, you know, six feet wide everywhere. So I could pretty well access the entire acre with a golf cart. And, you know, people could pick. I also built on Hugo Culture Mounds so that people who are sitting could pick you know, they all don't have to bend down, the, the plants are higher. So all of that, yes, good question. Thank you all. I so appreciate you, being able to answer questions because my first presentation, I got cut off and I couldn't answer any questions. So thank you. Thank um, you. And again, don't forget.
please don't forget all of all of the recordings will be online till December first. And ask and, any questions you want online to be answered. And, uh, they should by the way, I'm doing the you pick by appointment um, in the next session, in the next room. I mean, at four, I think it's four four twenty or something, four four forty, something like that. If you're interested.